Hello, party people, and welcome to another episode of Office Hours, where you post questions at the URL in the description, and then I go through and answer them live. I pick whichever ones y'all vote as the top voted questions. Sometimes when I have a whole lot of time, I go through and answer all of them. Today, I'm not going to answer all of them because there are a ton already in the queue. I'm going to focus on just the ones that are top voted. Hello, CTI geek. Uh, good to see you in here today. Uh, so let's see what's uh, up in the queue. There's some interesting stuff in here. The first one is from Steve who asks, Hi Brent, have you ever come across any environments using application roles? Well, so here's the thing. I actually have a contract that prohibits me from doing security work. I don't want to know anything about it because y'all do the nastiest, craziest things with security. And as soon as I like take the slightest bit, bit of a look at it, I want to recoil in horror. I'm like, why is everyone sharing the SA login? Why is every linked server set up with SA permissions? I could go on and on about the horrifying stuff. I remember the time that I saw a table in the master database with users and passwords. I was like, why would you do that? Why are you saving passwords in clear text? Hey, uh, uh, Tom, Tom and Yorks, good to see you. Thanks for the uh, subscription there for Prime. So my contract prohibitly excludes any security work whatsoever. So I'm not a good person to give advice on security. It also is my idea of a personal hell, like having to go through and be responsible for somebody's SQL Server security. Because I have never seen good security. Often I just open the door and I'm like, oh, I don't want to look in there. That was disgusting. I'm just going to tell you to go seek professional help. Next up, we have Broken Hearts, who says, you discourage the use of auto shrink. And then he's got a whole bunch of long stuff inside the question. Then the question ends up with, I've had auto shrink on for six months now, and I see problems. So, so you're doing something I told you not to see, or you're to doing something I told you not to do, and you're seeing problems. I wonder if that's why I told you not to do it. Hmm. Interesting how that works. Next question. We got old corn cob who says, I attempted to hit the Stack Overflow database on Smart Postgres. I couldn't figure out what I was missing. I just got an SSL error that connection was reset. I tried a few SSL settings, but no dice. Is there a how-to guide that could help? Yes, it was written by a very good friend of mine, a French person, Michael Google. It's not Michael Buble, it's Michael Google. If you check out Michael Google's site, he's got a whole bunch of interesting stuff in there, especially around dBeaver and SSL connection reset. So check out big thanks to my friend Michael Google, who does all that incredible work. Next up, we have Eduardo, who says, what are your pros and cons of running SSIS on your one and only SQL server versus a dedicated SQL server? Oh, that's such a great question. When you first get started running SSIS, using it to populate a data warehouse, or you're moving data in between a couple of servers so that you can avoid linked server queries, for example, you can save a lot of money by putting SSIS on the same SQL server, whether it's a VM or a physical box or cloud VM. You can save a lot of money by putting it on the same server as your database engine. As the, your workloads in SSIS grow, you may hit a point where you hear the job overnight doesn't run quickly enough. When you get to that point, the most cost effective way to do it is usually to spend some time tuning the SSIS job. But once you're past that, if you find that the SSIS server and the SQL server are both trying to compete for resources at the same time, because after all, what are you doing with SSIS? You're pulling data in and out of that very same SQL server that shares the same hardware. If you hit a point where that's a performance wall for you, then you start to ask, all right, does it make more sense to peel SSIS off to its own VM, spend a few thousand bucks on SQL Server licensing there, and let it consume all the, the horsepower that it needs? 
But as long as no one's complaining about how long the, the jobs take to run, as long as you're only doing them overnight, you're usually fine for years. Uh, next up, my tea got cold says, where can I read up on the risks of having a database owned by someone who's going to leave my business? That is a great question. If you run SP Blitz, if you run my free uh, server health check store procedure, SP Blitz, there's a warning for databases that are owned by people other than SA. There's a URL in there. Copy paste that URL into your browser. I, honest to God, don't remember uh, where the URL points to. Uh, I've got a lot of things that I have to remember. And as long as it's right there in SP Blitz, I don't have to remember it. I can just copy paste it and go, here you go. Next up, Robinson says, when I'm opening SSMS Activity Monitor, the state automatically changed to pause. I have some problems. I would like help. Absolutely. The first thing that you do is stop running Activity Monitor. Sounds like goofy advice, but it's a garbage product. What you want to do instead is either use SP Blitz first, SP Blitz first is a stored procedure that I wrote that takes a five second sample of what's going on on the server and then gives you a prioritized list of reasons why the SQL server might be slow right now. Or if you just want to see which queries are running right now, run SP Blitz who or SP who is active. Both of those effectively do the same thing. It's just whichever one you're more comfortable with. That's what I would do is get rid of that old crappy activity monitor and switch over to the new hotness. SQL Dev DBA says hi. Alpha Cronus says hi. Howdy, folks. I'm doing quite well today. I'm doing very well, although I am down to my last like drink. I tend to usually when I'm drinking on this uh, thing, you'll see me either drinking coffee or Diet Coke, like caffeine free Diet Coke. This I'm down to my last things. I have a whole fridge just dedicated to beverages. And it's been way too long since I did an order. And the only things left in the fridge are regular uh, uh, Coke, regular Sprite, which are like loaded with carbs. And for some reason, it just doesn't do very well for me. Um, Solutions Group Unlimited says, or he drinks gin. And that's absolutely true. Gin and tonic, uh, uh, tequila, red wine, big kicks on uh, all of those. But I don't usually do them during office hours, although I need to do a hot tub office hours. Uh, Alpha Corona says, I bet there's something in the bar that could stretch that drink out. And I honestly thought about it, but it's only 9.30 a.m. here, and I have conference calls that I have to do later in the day. So I'm like, I need to uh, work on that. Tom says, how often do you head uh, down to the strip for drinks or eats? At least twice a week, at least three or at least twice a week, sometimes three or four times a week. Um, we're, we are tomorrow. We're going to Mount Charleston. We're going to drive the Ferrari up Mount Charleston and do a fashion photo shoot. We have a friend of ours who's a fashion photographer and another friend who's a model. Um, and so we're using the Ferrari in the snow up at Mount Charleston for a photo shoot. After that, because everybody will be all dressed up, all fancy, uh, we'll probably go down to the strip uh, and do dinner there. SQL Dev DBA says, are you a fan of sparkling water at all? No, generally I'm not a big fan of those. I do like Pellegrino or uh, sparkling, like plain sparkling waters when I'm eating dinner, but that's about it. Next up, we have Insecure DBA who says, a new third-party app requires a certificate for SSL connections to our SQL server. Wow, I don't think I've ever heard that. That's pretty cool. Will adding one require any additional work for all other databases on the server? Not at all. It's up to you if you want to uh, specify SSL when you go and connect. Um, I don't remember what the, any of the syntax type stuff is on the driver's side, but you, you should be fine. Alpha Grunna says a Ferrari with snow tires and steel rims. No, I, I, uh, I think I'm going to leave just the regular tires on it. We'll do a little slip and slide uh, around. Uh, but the roads are pretty decent up there as long as you're careful. So I should be OK. Knock on wood. If not, this will be the last video I ever record. <laughs> Um, Ramulo asks, hi, Brian, is there any other way to dynamically save stored procedure results into a temp table without knowing the structure of the table and not using open row set? I'm sure there is, but I, I don't know of it. 
those two things that you just specified there, those are what I always use. So it's kind of like saying, hey, Brent, is there any way to cut paper without using scissors or tearing it? Well, why would you not just use scissors? That's what they're for. That's what those pieces are for. Yusuf asks a funny question, and this is going to sound like I'm going to give a trolling answer, but I'm not. Yusuf says, new Microsoft keyboards are adding a chat GPT button. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? I think it's a great idea. I use chat GPT all the time. I usually keep a browser window open to it as like a reminder to myself that I need to rely on it more. And I'll copy paste things into there, ask it questions and so forth. I have a paid GPT-4 account so that I can use the new Turbo. Works beautifully. Love it, love it, love it. Um, I don't use Siri at all. It tends to give really crappy answers. Like the only thing that I use it for is to remind me about something hours in the future when I'm in the car. But otherwise, it, the, mostly the results for me for Siri for anything technical are hot garbage. Whereas I love ChatGPT. I use a Mac, so it's not like I'm going to be using that keyboard. It doesn't really make a lot of sense for me. But if I was a Windows, Windows person, I would be right there. SQL Dev DBA says, uh, Copilot and Loop are super good. I was afraid Loop would be vaporware, but man, I really like it versus Confluence and others. I don't even know what Loop is, which is kind of funny. I don't, the, the AI market is moving so fast and furious these days. Uh, next up, Demetra says, how do the DBA job opportunities differ for when a DBI, DBA specializes versus uh, not specializing? So when you specialize, you can tend to raise your rates dramatically. Like when you know a whole lot about one particular thing and you're known as the person for that thing, then what you'll find is that companies will pick be like, get me the person for X, you know, whatever X is. We're having problems with, and I'm going to pick a super niche technology. We're having problems with service broker. Go get me the service broker person. Then if server service broker is really popular, you can make an absolute fortune. I cannot tell you, people in chat are kind of joking around, I cannot tell you how often that's happened. I cannot tell you, one of my favorite stories ever was one of the company owners of a company walked over to the head of IT, gave him his Platinum Amex card and said, I don't care what it takes, get Brent here as fast as you can. Don't worry about it. whatever airfare, hotel, whatever the guy charges, anything he wants, get him here as fast as you can. They ended up being one of my best clients for a really long time, too, as well. But when you're known as the person for that thing, life works out really well for you. If you do everything, you're in competition with everybody, including the people who don't charge anything. So it's tough to raise your rates there. Uh, let's see, uh, next one, uh, Gol, Gol Shifta says, I've got SQL Server 2019. I'm updating a fax server with a linked server query. It takes over 20 hours. Yep, don't use that technology. If you want to do data warehousing type work, the, the tool that you want to use, or tools, I'll give you a couple, SSIS, SQL Server Integration Services, Azure Data Factory, aka ADF, or if you're over in the Amazon stack, AWS Glue. These are all three totally different technologies that do not leverage much of your T-SQL skills. You may love using T-SQL in order to do data warehousing, to move place tables from one place to another via linked servers. What you just find is it doesn't scale very well in terms of performance or of your career. I want to help you with both of those. So either learn SSIS, Azure Data Factory, or Amazon Glue, whichever one your company prefers using or is open to using. Soji says, is rows per page a good table metric? And is it actionable? No. Next question. Borglund says, what is your favorite app for generating synthetic data headed for query testing of large data in a development environment? So I don't have that job responsibility. And the clients that I have who do it struggle with it all the time. Like nobody comes up with a good answer. 
So you have a couple of a couple of different choices. One is that you can just generate some small random data and live with it. But two, if you really want to generate production size data, you're going to need some kind of third party tool to do it. And I've never seen a good one. I've never heard of a good one. And the ones that even suck cost a lot of money. So there you go. Next up, DBA Emeritus says, I'm having trouble with deadlocks on something that inserts records and then immediately updates those same records. I've tried every fix I could divine. Any advice for this specific pattern? Yes, don't do that. Instead of inserting and then updating something, you're saying you want to do something based on their identities. Use sequences. With sequences, you can get the identity values that you want to use prepare the data and then just insert it once without having to do round trips back and forth to the databases. Sequences, they've been out there for, I'm going to guess, at least a decade now. You're, you're not alone in never using them before. The vast majority of database developers I know have never touched them in the SQL Server space. They're really common in other spaces. Uh, but check out sequences. That's going to be the big key there. And then we'll do one more. Eduardo says, do you ever foresee Azure SQL DB growth eclipsing the boxed SQL server? Yes. I think some forms of platform as a service databases will eclipse SQL server in the sense that you're going to see less and less boxed product deployments over time. Because as people build new applications these days, it's generally not cost effective to use SQL Server. Generally, most people who are building new applications these days and they're thinking about where to host the databases, if you're a database administrator, developers don't really like you. They don't like having to ask for your permission. They don't think you do a particularly good job. They ask you for help, and you say condescending things about their code. I suppose I should take some responsibility for that because I'm a role model, and I kind of say condescending things about your questions from time to time. But when I work with clients and developers, I try to use the carrot and the stick methodology back and forth. I try to use the carrot as much as I can, not just the stick, because I want to encourage people to do good things. Developers are sick and tired of working with database administrators, and so cloud platform as a service databases are exceedingly attractive to those folks who are sick and tired of working with people like you. I think it's going to take decades just as the server side shift from Windows to Linux took decades in order to accomplish. Now Linux is the number one operating system server side worldwide, like all over the place. You'd be, uh, which is kind of a, a thing that we all take for granted now, thanks to the advent of the web. The same kind of shift will happen with box product SQL Server over to platform as a service databases. It's going to take uh, decades. But then at a point, all, everybody's going to look around and be like, wait a minute, what happened to all the box product SQL servers? I know it's unconscionable to think about right now because a lot of people out there are like, I will never use the cloud. I need high security. No one else can do it like I can. But then, you know, I look at your SQL servers and you're so chock full of security holes. Everybody's got the SA password and they're all using it. It's taped up on monitors everywhere. There's no security in the data center. Anybody could walk out with a backup at any time. SQL servers can access the Internet. There's no firewalls or anything. So I think that there's a lot of bravado. But over time, as new applications get built, more of them are going to use platform as a service databases. All right. Uh, <laughs> SQL Dev DBA says we put our passwords under the, the keyboard. That way it's PCI compliant. <laughs> All right. So there wraps up another round of questions over from Office Hours. If there are any that you want to see covered in the next episode, you can take a minute to go upvote those now. There's a slew of questions over there in the queue. I'm going to call it quits. I'm going to go place a beverage order, actually. Go get some more Diet Coke around here. And I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios.